Good evening and welcome to the 26th annual Peter and Viola Dali Endowed Lecture in Church Art and Architecture. This uh, lecture was established by Adam Dali in honor of his parents. Uh, I think sometimes when people think of art, they think of things that are pretty and kind of you know icing on the cake, but Adam is certainly someone who believes that uh, art and our environment uh, informs who we are and who we become. I think it's interesting that he dedicated it to his parents who were not famous people. Uh, they were famous to their, to their family, but they are the people who gather on a Sunday morning in all the parishes throughout the world. And uh, this lecture tries to say that their space and how it's shaped uh, is very important to their experience of prayer. Over the years, we've had uh, lots of different, we've had architects and artists, we've had pastors who have just built a church and come to talk about that. Uh, this evening, we're going to have a kind of a different talk. Uh, I invited Father Eifler uh, to come and he's wanting to talk about how art and architecture, not just church art and architecture, certainly that, but not just that, has kind of shaped his own life and priesthood. Uh, and so I'm very happy that I had the good sense to figure this out. <laughs> and with that, I invite Brother Jerry. It's awfully good to be back at St. Meinrich. I haven't been in this theater for a number of years, but uh, while I was here as a student, uh, it was a very familiar place for me. Not only uh, from the opportunity to put on plays and shows and the rest, but this was a place where we gathered weekly to uh, practice homilies. And when I reflect upon coming here and practicing homilies. I shudder in fear, <laughs> even to today. I was ordained in 1961 and uh, was very happy to go to the Archdiocese of Louisville and uh, take up residence as a associate in some parish. I grew up in, Holy, in uh, Louisville at the Holy Spirit of the East End. Uh, my mother and father moved up there uh, when I was about four or five years old, and I have a younger sister who's with me this evening. And uh, so we lived in this new neighborhood that was uh, being created uh, from farmland. Uh, if you know anything about Louisville, there's a place called Lexington Road in Cannons Lane. And uh, that's where we, uh, we uh, grew up and uh, lived. and. Uh, in my 54 years of being a priest, I have never been farther away than five miles from that spot in my assignments, which is somewhat of a record, I think. And I had nothing to do with it. Art and architecture has been a compulsion of mine since the very beginning, I think, of life. I was fascinated with the houses being built in our neighborhood. I uh, like to go and watch the men and dig the basements and pour the concrete and uh, fashion the houses and put the brick on and all the rest. And I was just amazed at how that happened. Uh, I went to the grade school there at the Holy Spirit. And um, things were going, I guess, pretty well until I discovered that I couldn't do something that somebody else did. I really wasn't too good at sports. 
And uh, yet, uh, I made the team, the basketball team, one year. But to be perfectly honest, the reason why I made the team that year was because my father furnished the steel for the banking boards. <laughs> and so they had to put the old man's kid on the team. Uh, I grew up in a very uh, a solid home. Uh, my parents were uh, very, very good to us. And uh, they were stable people, hospitable people, and uh, pretty much allowed us to play in the neighborhood and do the things that we like to do. My father was a businessman, and uh, he had introduced us, introduced the family to St. Mindred long before I even considered coming to school here. He furnished a lot of the steel for this very building that we're sitting in this evening. He only had one job in his entire life. He went to work for a company in 1917 and then closed the company down in 1985. So stability was something that I sort of took for granted. But yet there was something missing in my life and, and I began to feel less than and I didn't know what it was and I had a difficulty with reading. People would say, oh, Jerry, pay attention. <laughs> or, oh, Jerry, don't look out the window. But I still had a difficulty with reading. The um, sixth grade made the difference. There was an ingenious woman named Sister Eugenia. Sister Eugenia discovered something that hardly anybody else had noticed. She brought in large pieces of, uh, of uh, newsprint and she put them on the uh, board and she said, now Jerry, why don't you draw what you hear us reading about? Well, that was pretty easy. I like drawing. And so I would get up to the board and I would draw this picture. And uh, I began to uh, discover the thing that was missing in my life was a bit of self-esteem. Well, I wasn't an athlete and I was too bright, I thought, in school. Uh, this gave me a sense of well-being. And so uh, the first portrait I'm going to show you tonight is a portrait that I painted later on in life. I painted in the late 60s when I uh, enrolled in the School of Art at Anchorage, Kentucky. And um, it was a challenge because the professor said, you have to give us a self-portrait. What was I going to do with a self-portrait? You know? How do you paint a self-portrait? I thought of milk bottles, and I thought the line uh, of something about full of uh, richness and flavor or something like I saw in an ad one time. But I decided to tackle the um, task. And I have entitled this particular portrait the process of becoming. And I say it's a process of becoming because it's just the beginning of self-discovery. The portrait. That portrait has meant a lot to me as it began to deal with life on life's terms. I. Uh, Went through grade school, then went to St. X High School in Louisville. Uh, entered into all the activities. Had a, an ability to draw, write, photograph. Became chairman of the dance committee of the school. And then finally, after uh, taking double courses in scientific and classical subjects, taking a lot of drawing, I decided that my goal in life was to become an architect. And that was fine with my father. He told me repeatedly, whatever you do in life, make sure you're happy in doing it. And so I signed up to go away to college to become an architect. The only difficulty was that um, I went to Gethsemane for the senior retreat with the rest of the seniors that year. 
And as things happen, I discovered that uh, maybe something else was in store for me. So I came home, moped around, chewed on the idea that I had that maybe I'd want to be a priest. My father was sitting on the back porch on a Saturday morning after cutting grass, drinking a beer and reading the paper. And he spoke to me over the paper and he said, uh, what's on your mind? And I said, well, I don't know. He said, uh, well, tell me. And I said, well, I think I want to go to St. Mary's College. He said, where is that? And I said, down in Kentucky. And he said, well, he said, um, is it a good architectural school? And I said, no. And he said, well, what is it? What kind of place is it? And I said, it's a seminary. But with that, the paper came down slowly. <laughs> he looked at me and he said, whatever you do, make sure you're happy in doing it. And that's all he said. The process was changed. I broke up with the girl I was going with. Uh, I, uh, by that time, had been uh, in uh, high school, and uh, uh, Sister Eugenia is here on the board, and uh, she was my inspiration. She gave me an interest that I cherish today, art and architecture. By that time, I had been elected to the chairman of the student body at St. X, and um, that was a rather prestigious position to have, and uh, I enjoyed it. And then came the reality of going to the seminary. Uh, my father and mother uh, are pictured in this particular uh, shot. Uh, my father uh, would say, are you happy? If not, I'll come and get you. Finally, I told him after the second time, he said that, leave me alone, I'll be calling you if I need you. <laughs> and he was fine about that. My father was uh, born of a, an Irish mother and a first generation German man. And he was the victim of the depression. And his philosophy was, work hard, save your money, and live below your means. If I heard that one time, I still hear it in my sleep. <laughs> but he was absolutely right. And uh, I uh, tried to subscribe to his philosophy of life, especially the business of being happy. Uh, I came to St. Mindred after graduating from school at St. Mary's College down in Kentucky. And in this very theater, I was painting on that stage the uh, clipping from the Evansville Press that I have up there for you. I'm the one in the center, in case you can't tell. That's me. <laughs> and we were painting the scenery for Murder in the Cathedral, which happens to be right outside the door, that uh, uh, advertisement poster. They didn't know what the, t the date was, but I can tell you, it's right here. It's right there, 1958, 1968. No, 58, that's it. 1958. And so uh, I've had that thing stuck away in an album. And when I started preparing for this particular talk, I thought, aha, I can finally show one of my treasures from St. Mindred. <laughs> While I was here, I uh, dabbled a bit in painting. Uh, not knowing much, continuing to draw, continuing to draw cartoons, continuing to do the other things that I like to do as a hobby. Uh, here at St. Minard, I decided to venture into oil painting. And so uh, this was a painting that I did here at St. Minard, I think my second year. It's a copy of Rouault's Christ and the Four Evangelists. I didn't have anything to paint it on. I painted it on a bed sheet. <laughs> I went down to the uh, carpenter shop and got a um, uh, carpenter to make me a frame and tack that thing on it and then put some gesso or some sealer on it. And I sat down in my room and I painted that. I still have that painting. 
It's in my studio today. But it was a real adventure because what I discovered in the process of doing that, that I became totally absorbed in the technique. You see, when you enter into painting or you enter into drawing or you enter into music or you enter into anything that, that can be considered an art, it's not the finished product that really gives you the zest or the excitement. It's the process of becoming. It's the process of mixing the colors. It's the process of doing the sketch. It's the process of standing back and then adding more or taking off. Life is a process. All life is a process. There's a beginning and then there is another opportunity to do something else along the line. That's why I would, I would entitle this particular talk this evening, The Process of Becoming. Well, I felt pretty good about that painting, although it started to deteriorate about 15 years ago. But it meant so much to me, I went ahead and took it and glued it to canvas, restretched it, and I still have it today. I was interested in all kinds of other things here at uh, St. Meinrad, and by the time we were designing chalices, uh, I designed my own and the chalice of a number of other guys in the class ahead of me and with me. This is my chalice that I had made. It's a copy of a Tassillo chalice. Count Tassillo had that design made, but this one was made in uh, France. So my parents gave me the chalice, and I was ordained, and so I wanted to have a business card made that says, have chalice, we'll travel. <laughs> and off we go into the priesthood. The first parish I went to was an interesting parish. It was our Mother of Sorrows on Eastern Parkway. There was something very unique about our Mother of Sorrows parish. What was unique was the church was on the end of a block. There was a parking lot. Then there was a fourplex apartment house, then there was a school, and then the convent. Now one of the uh, teachers here at St. Meinrad made a visit to that place, that parish, to give a talk. Father Bernard Beck, long gone, taught us moral. He came back and he said, as he would in class, do you know where I've been? I'll tell you where I've been. I went to a house of ill repute last night. <laughs> he got the rectory mixed up with this fourplex. <laughs> the fourplex was an institution of Louisville, Kentucky. It was the establishment of Annie Haynes, the head madam of the community. <laughs> That's the parish I moved into. <laughs> Little did I know that within a matter of years, when I was appointed the administrator of the parish, that Miss Haynes would go to our bank and want a loan. The loan call, the bank called me and he said, the president called me and he said, uh, Miss Haynes wants to borrow some money. We want to put a clause in there. If there's any uh, notoriety that comes out of her property, that uh, you'll buy it. And I said, well, that sounds good to me. So I did buy the house three or four months later because there was notoriety and it cost us $45,000. I tell you that story because that was my first opportunity to get involved in some remodeling and architecture. We took the house and uh, the pastor was getting ready to retire. So we put the housekeeper on one apartment, the pastor on the other, on the first floor, and then the nuns on the second floor. And uh, that's the way the house ended for many, many years until uh, the parish uh, didn't have housekeepers and nuns and a retired priest anymore. But during that time, a lot of things were happening. The 60s were volatile for a lot of people, including myself. Uh, the first year I was ordained was a, not an easy year. I think I practically drowned the baby when I first baptized it. The, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the bride, the first wedding I had, she fainted dead away. 
uh, I picked her up off the floor and drug her across the altar. And then I was blessing throats, and I felt that if I closed my eyes, I could repeat the prayer in Latin. And all of a sudden, the, the little kid she was holding, the woman who was holding, took the candles and threw them around. All, all, all the, you know. I thought, you know, I don't think I can go much through this much longer. I have to find something else to do in life. There was a controversy bringing out. The Vatican Council was just starting. Uh, civil rights were rampant. Uh, the clergy were split in the diocese, the old versus the new, young. Uh, then there was the young priests who were teaching and the young priests that were in parish work and who was working the hardest and all this stuff was going on and on and on and on. And it, it was not a good time. It wasn't a good time for the church in those days in the 60s. It wasn't a good time for the people. It certainly wasn't a good time for me. During that time, I decided that I would go and go to the archbishop and offer my services as an architect. If he'd teach me, send me away to school. So uh, indeed, I, uh, I went to the, the archbishop flourish and I had a meeting with him. And he was very fatherly, and he said, what can I do for you, or what do you want, what do you need? I said, Archbishop, you're having a lot of people build a lot of schools and churches in the diocese, and you're building a, uh, starting a new parish every six to eight months in the diocese. Maybe I could be of help. Why don't you send me to school, and I'll become your architect? There was a long pause. And he said, Father, why don't you go home and you pray about it? I'll pray about it and I'll call you. Don't you call me. <laughs> I felt absolutely satisfied. I decided, okay, that's what I'll do. I'll go ahead and, and go off and uh, he'll call me in a matter of months and become, a, become a, an architect for the Archdiocese of Louisville. Well, um, some time passed, three years to be exact. <laughs> and he called me one day. And he said, Father, he said, uh, are you still interested in graduate school? And I said, yes. Architecture? And he said, no, psychology. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean psychology? And he said, well, I need a psychologist to start a uh, clinic, marriage counseling and divorce counseling. I don't need an architect. And I thought to myself, well, it beats a blank, you know. <laughs> so I thought, well, I was interested in that topic too. So I went ahead and, and he said, get your feet wet and see what you think and let me know. And so that's exactly what I did. I went off and became, got a master's in clinical and then opened up an agency with some doctors and some other people. And it was called the Family Relations Center in Louisville. Now, in retrospect, I have to tell you, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. He didn't need me as an architect, but I needed to find out what was going on amidst all the confusion of the 60s. It was at that time then that I decided that I was going to find some therapy. Half my classmates were leaving. People that I respected, a little older than I, were leaving the priesthood. I thought to myself, maybe they know something I don't know. I know what I've been taught, but there's going to be another side to it. So with that, I went and uh, entered into uh, a thera therapy uh, experience with uh, a man that I grew to love and, and certainly respect. He was a Moravian. He wasn't Catholic. People ask me, why, don't, why didn't you, you uh, go to the Catholic? And I said, well, you know, I knew the Catholic stuff. I wanted to know the rest of it. So for three years, every week, I would meet with this man. And uh, he patiently uh, took me through the process of discovery. Again, I'm back to the same topic in the portrait, the process of becoming. It gave me a bigger and better identification of myself, who I am, what I can do, what makes me tick, what are my needs, how do we find those things that we search and we uh, think we need. 
He was a, a very, very significant individual in my life. Father Lyons, the old pastor, I'm going to show you right now. There's the man. He was my mentor, delightful man. And he did something equally as important for me at that time. He said, my boy, whatever you do, get yourself something that can sustain you for the rest of your life as a hobby. He said, never put all of your emotional eggs into one basket. He demonstrated that himself. Outside of being a parish priest and a writer, he was also a historian. And so at that time then, I began to reevaluate art. And uh, I decided then that I would leave my priest friends uh, on Wednesdays at the day off, and I would then go to study to the, at the Louisville School of Art. And that's precisely what I did. And uh, I was playing the Bohemian at that time. I put on some jeans, get a bottle of wine, an apple, go out to this studio, spend the day. It was marvelous. It was a element in self-discovery. It was fitting together all of the things that I'd learned with the therapists, and yet also it was giving me a sense of well-being about delving into what it means to be able to create. And so the uh, 60s were wild, painful, but yet many of us survived it. And I'm very grateful for that. This is the first painting I painted in that studio. And um, it's not a fine painting, but it's pretty good. It's right there. <laughs> It's an old door with, a, with a, a jacket hanging on it, a hat, and a stool. That was um, a model set up in the studio. And uh, after I got finished, I thought, yeah, that's really good. Because every time I went back and I started to put another stroke on that painting and I started to rework that painting to bring it up to where I was almost sure that it was complete, I felt good about the mystery and the art, uh, the ability to paint. So that launched me then into a significant other set of circumstances that I, uh, I uh, found myself involved in. I was going to graduate school studying psychology. I was painting. I was uh, uh, taking time for myself. I was uh, developing new relationships and new friends. And uh, I continued on the uh, process of uh, being assigned to another parish as a resident. And this time I went to uh, an interesting parish <clears throat> called St. Therese. This was the Christmas card I drew for St. Therese at that time. This was the first of Christmas cards that I still draw today. This was in 1970. So you can figure out the math and know how many Christmas cards I make. This was the Spanish church. It was a wonderful church. It was in Germantown. I remember Germantown. It was a place where the people swept the streets and the alleys and there was no dirt and everything. all the houses were all nicely little crisp houses. But by the time I got to St. Therese, I found out that there was something going on. There was deterioration within the community. Oh, I also went back to UofL and I was studying community development at the time. Community development was something I found very interesting in my experience because I wanted to know the flow and the ebb of people in an area. What makes people move into this particular place or what makes people move out of this particular place? And the more I studied, the more I discovered that industry had underlined many of the areas in that, in that, uh, that neighborhood. And it was becoming uh, rental and uh, people were not owning their houses, they couldn't afford the insurance and so on. They were unlined, they were underlined, redlined. They call it in the trade. Something had to be done. So with the help and the conversation of a Baptist minister who was over on the area, he and I got together and decided that we were going to get the businessmen of the community together 
to form an opportunity, a neighborhood association that would prevent redlining in the neighborhood and provide the people with the opportunity to redevelop their homes. At the same time we were doing this, I discovered too that this area was called Paris Town. It was a curiosity to me, Paris Town. Nobody ever spoke of it as Paris Town, but then when I got the ancient maps out, I discovered that all of the streets around this particular church were all at one first time named in French names, Dupree, Adair, and so on. So that prompted me then to go ahead and to do an oral history of the people that lived in the community. And so I went around and I visited all those old people and they told me wonderful stories about Paris Town and about the, the uh, happenings of the first priest who was named Beersheim. And Beersheim was a German and he didn't like the French. And so there was a tug of war right there. A lot of local history that continued and after I had collected all of my tapes and information, I uh, gave it to the University of Louisville. There's a oral history department there. We developed then with the people an opportunity to uh, build again Paris Town and rename the area. This picture here is a sketch of all the little houses that are along the street of Schiller, Schiller right here. They were all much the same, but the big task we had was in this church. That church had been renovated and it was a beautiful interior for the new liturgy. That is probably the best I've ever seen in any place in Louisville. But the towers were coming down. Unfortunately, the concrete, uh, instead of using con stone, limestone, they used pressed concrete. It became like a, a um, sponge. Water came down through the walls and the towers were, were uh, beginning to crumble. There was suggestion by the diocese that we would take off the towers, cut it right there. Look what it would do to that church. It'd be hideous. So the Baptist minister and I set about raising money for the renovation of the towers and the stabilization of the building. It had nothing to do with interior architecture. It had everything to do with exterior architecture. And so as things go, people caught on. They liked the idea. They came to our rescue and we raised enough money to stabilize the towers. They're still up today. St. Therese was an interesting place to be. And we decided that we would do a little bit more with the whole area. So with the help of historians in the neighborhood, we found that at the top, there's an area called Paris Town. This is Germantown. And down here is another area of the city called Schnitzelburg. I can tell you that when I went there as a, pa as a priest to Paris Town, there were 32 taverns on the streets in that area. <laughs> Do you know what a grawler is? Has anybody heard the word grawler? What's a grawler? It's like a or something. That's right. I found out what a grawler was. A grawler is a beer bucket. And if you want to get the best measure of the beer from the tap, rub butter or lard on the inside and you have no foam. Right? <laughs> now you know the rest of the story. I was uh, asked to be in politics in this particular place. They wanted to run me for alderman, and I said, no, I'm not getting into politics. If I ask someone to vote for me, then I'll have to answer to their needs or their wants. And I'm not going to put myself in that position. I was still doing therapy with the Family Relations Center, and then Bellarmine College came to me and asked me if I would come and become the director of development for the college. So I left St. Therese. I went to Bellarmine College over Newburg Road, and I started in the process of raising money for the college. And uh, I was also scheduled or selected to be the vice president of the college when the, uh, vice, the original vice president was going to retire. He was a priest. 
I was uh, working there. I was going around uh, meeting uh, uh, the uh, wealthy of the community and outside, dealing with foundations, going to the Rotary Club and doing all kinds of other things. And I was head of the faculty house for the priests. But I wasn't a priest. I didn't get into the priesthood to become a businessman. Quite the contrary. I missed liturgy. I missed people. And it wasn't to my liking. I had nowhere to, uh, didn't have a place to, to celebrate Holy Thursday one year. So I called up the pastor of the cathedral and I said, come out, come down and, and uh, celebrate uh, liturgy with you. I'll just stand in the back. He said, sure, come on down. So uh, the old Archbishop Flourish had died and uh, Archbishop McDonough had come on the scene and he was a wonderful man. <laughs> we were vesting and he said, um, why don't you ask me for a parish? And I said, well, well, why should I ask you for a parish? And he said, well, maybe you ought to. <laughs> and I let that pass. And then um, a little later on, he said, you know, you really ought to do that. And then we went out on the altar. And at a sign of peace, he came up to me and I said, peace to your archbishop. And he said, ask me tonight, it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's been smoking something, I know he has. <laughs> so afterwards, uh, after liturgy, I, uh, I uh, went to him and I said, I think you and I need to talk. And he said, yes, come here. So he asked me if I would take a particular parish that was adjacent to the college. And uh, I said, oh, I don't know. I said, I really, really need to take that to prayer and <laughs> to my spiritual director and Anybody else that'll listen to me, because I don't know about that. The parish was in terrible shape. It was toxic. The uh, previous administrators, administrators had really messed this parish up. And so uh, I, um, I thought about it, and I went back with a proposal. I said, uh, I'm aware of some of the difficulties you've had. But I said, from my vantage point, the parish is so toxic, I don't think I can handle it. If you expect me to keep everybody in place that's there. So if you allow me to clean house totally, from the parish school to the rectory to the assistant to everybody, and you give me an associate that I can work with to reconstruct this parish, then uh, I'll agree. So he said, yes, that's fine. And uh, so he said, give me three names of priests you think you can work with for this uh, assignment. And I said, okay, so I did. And he chose a, a wonderful man. He was the best that he could possibly have given me. And when the, rumor, or when the, when the word came out that I was coming to this particular parish, uh, all hell broke loose. The people were absolutely, by the way, that's, I forgot to show you the the welcome sign of the neighborhood association that we had just started at St. Therese, but that's a little while ago. Um, it ended up that um, uh, there was a committee that uh, got together and said, uh, we don't want him as a pastor. And one guy wrote me a letter and said, if you uh, move any of the marble in this church, may it fall on you and kill you. Uh, and all kinds of stuff, you know, so I really felt welcomed. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that sustained me, though, I have to tell you, at this particular time, and I'm a little ahead of my story, was the fact that uh, before I left uh, St. Therese in Germantown, or Paris Town, I was looking for a piece of property that I could uh, work on. So, uh, I discovered 10 acres over in southern Indiana, the very center of 1,400 acres that was given to a man for fighting in the Revolutionary War. His name was Jacob Hicks. This 10 acres was going to be bulldozed down and a subdivision was going to go into it. And uh, there was a wonderful old cabin on that, log cabin. 
built in 1817. And I'm standing in front of that cabin in that picture. Uh, that's exactly what I wanted. I was looking for. I wanted to build something. I wanted to research something. I wanted to go back and find out how you put a log cabin together. And if you know much about me, you'll find out that I take plenty of time to figure out what's underneath most situations. I don't want to make the mistake again. So uh, I bought this property. There were five junk cars on the property. My father thought I had lost my mind. And uh, I had the help of a lot of friends. And they came and we got rid of the junk property. And uh, that cabin that you're seeing there turned into this building here. And in doing so, I found in a well, sterling silver hairbrush. I found all kinds of uh, early uh, 19th century uh, bottles and stuff like that. Adjacent to that was a stone building. Uh, it was 30 feet square. The roof had caved in in 1941. Uh, it was probably a keep or a fort, fortress for that day. And I uh, slavishly had all of the um, pintails and the um, hinges and all that type of thing copied. And I built that again too. And that's what that is. That was finished in 70, 77, 78. That's the interior looking down. There are only th three walls in, every, in all the rooms in that building, two bedrooms, two baths, living room, dining room. Uh, that was a feature in the Louisville Magazine on architecture that year. So I spent a lot of time there and a lot of friends came over and a lot of church uh, gatherings and parish gatherings and uh, I like to have people use the stuff that I have, but most of all, I like the process of doing it. Again, the process of becoming. I also like to travel too. And so uh, it was still at the 1979, I uh, received a call from St. Myron and they were dealing with a travel agent. I had been to Europe twice up to that time. And uh, some, one of my monk friends here gave, me, gave my name to this travel agent and asked me if I would be interested in taking some people to the Oktoberfest and the Passion Play in the same week. So that's sort of an interesting combination. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it works. So anyway, I said, no, I don't think so. I told some friends, and they said, we'll go with you. My mom said she'll go. My aunt said she'll go. The housekeeper said she'd go. <laughs> 38 of us went off and enjoyed the Passion Play and the Oktoberfest that year. That was the beginning. On the way back, they said, where are we going next year? This coming Saturday, I'm leaving for the 34th time to take a group to Europe. So it's been something else that has helped me, especially in learning art and architecture. Because when I go to foreign countries, I go to museums, I go to street corners, I go to look at cobblestones, I go to see everything that there is, and it broadens us. It gives me insight, it's stimulating. One of the great things about architecture, my friends, is this, that we know really good architecture when we find it. There's a church in Paris that I go to every time I go to Europe and I'm in Paris. I wouldn't miss spending an hour there by myself. The first time I discovered that church, it was in the middle of winter. I was on my way down to Rome to go on a six month sabbatical. And I went to this little church and I stood there. It was cold and I sat on the base of a column the walls were as black as coal, but it was built in the 1500s. And I took deep breaths, and I smelt what was going on. I can imagine incense and candles and beeswax and all that type of thing. And it was sense perceptive to me, and it was really, really good. 
That's what I find in art. That's what I find in architecture. When you get into art and you get into architecture, you see things differently than the way they are. You spend a lot more time looking and less time talking. And you try to remember in your mind those elements of a person, a place, or a thing that you've discovered. Well, needless to say, the trips have been fun. And uh, I'm looking forward to this next one, leaving Saturday morning, going to Germany, Salzburg, Vienna, Budapest, and Paris. Be back two weeks later. St. Francis of Assisi was a wonderful parish. That was the church that was toxic. After everything calmed down, we got together. People started coming back. I had the opportunity to renovate the school and the church. The school completely from library, curriculum, all the rest, and turn it into somewhat of an academy. Again, to enable the kids in the grade school to discover a sense of self-esteem about themselves. If they weren't good at reading, writing, and arithmetic, they could sure be good at something else. And I think that that is the main function of primary education, is to help the child discover something good about themselves that they feel good about. Once you have tasted that, you'll want more, and it will sustain you all the way through for the rest of your life. St. Francis of Assisi was copied off of Boys Town. It was a very dominant church on Barstown Road. And the bishop, when he sent me there, said, take that altar that the pastor had moved out four feet from the main rear dose and put it down on the floor. That's the Christmas card the first year I was there, one of many. That was the interior of the church. And... When I went to uh, St. Francis, there were 12 dining room chairs lining the whole sanctuary. There was another pulpit like this over here made of wood, and the altar was way up there on the rear dome. The pastor had been a woodworker, and so he put in all these chairs. Well, the people didn't want me to touch anything in that place. But I said, there has to be a way that I can clean out this sanctuary. So I'll give you a tip. If you find in your experience, this might serve. I brought in a huge ficus tree, a big bush about this big. And I put it on rollers and I put it in the sanctuary. And they said, why have you brought that big bush in the sanctuary? <laughs> I said, the reason I bought that big bush in the sanctuary is because it's soft. It gives a soft feel to all the marble and the sandstone in this place. Mm. Little did they know that when I moved my bush in front of any object up there that I wanted to move, whatever it moved in front of disappeared. <laughs> It took me about eight months, but I cleaned out that whole sanctuary, 12 dining room chairs, including a wooden pulpit. And to my knowledge, no one ever caught on. That was only the beginning. Then came the altar. There was a big communion rail going through there, and we had, they asked if we remove that. That's the altar that we made. This altar is made of what's something, a metal called monk's metal. It's a form of bronze. The uh, side panels were the gates of the communion rail, right here. And so uh, we took the marble that was on the top of the altar that the pastor had put up there, and then put this down here. And it's worked, say, it's worked very well. Then the pipe organ in the church was about ready to go out. In fact, it had gone out. 
Uh, there was nothing there. It had been secondhand at best. So uh, as the parish grew, people came involved. Uh, the school began to find uh, a new place in, its, uh, in the community. Uh, we then commissioned a pipe organ. The pipe organ was made by uh, Fritz Novak. And um, <clears throat> it is, uh, was a gift to the community. It cost uh, $250,000 in 1980 about. And um, uh, the uh, people in the area, the neighborhood, uh, respected it. And the Louisville Orchestra came and placed Sanson's uh, uh, organ piece as the opening of uh, that uh, dedication of that uh, organ. The uh, toxic condition of the parish had dissipated. Uh, the people came and the liturgies were held and uh, the interior of the church spoke of uh, the respect that the people had at that time for uh, their church and their community. We celebrated the 100th anniversary and we decided that we would commission a statue. This is the statue that they commissioned of St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, it, was, it was sculpted by a local uh, individual called, uh, her name was Charlotte Price. And uh, upon the dedication of the statue, we put in the ground a um, time capsule. And uh, that's what you see us doing at that point there. It's a delight to go down Bargetown Road now and looking over there and see kids standing by the statue. Pictures are made there. It's something that speaks to the people and the faith of that community. And uh, it, was, it was an interesting opportunity to, to do something like that. Again, during this time, I was still painting and developing and moving and doing things like that. Um, the next parish, the final parish that I went to was um, over on Frankfurt Avenue. It was the sister parish to the big one over on Barstown Road. This one was founded a year after that one. They were identical in a way. That was the sign for St. Francis of Rome Parish. And that was the church. That's the first church that was built a hundred and some odd years ago. St. Francis of Assisi had the same little church. So when I went over there, I had another unique experience. I had a parish where the past three priests had all died in the seventh year of their pastorate. <laughs> <clears throat> they were unfortunately uh, addicted to alcohol. Nothing much happened in the parish. There was a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. This parish school had closed. And at one time, they had, uh, they had a big um, program to build a very large church equal to St. Francis of Assisi. But it never got off the ground. Every parish has a personality. Some parishes are happy. Some are sad. Some are in mourning. Some are, are angry. Some are indifferent. Collectively, people react in situations that happen to them within their community. So when I went to St. Francis of Assisi, a Rome, after being at St. Francis of Assisi for 10 years, where everything was humming and buzzing and a lot of good things happening, nothing was happening there. People told me that the neighborhood had gone down so far that if you put anything on the back, on the, on the back porch, it'll be gone. It's not true. It wasn't gone. A transformation was going on in the community. Now, Francis of Rome sits in a prime spot along Frankfurt Avenue in Louisville, Kentucky, where some of the most successful restaurants are in Louisville. A lot of activity, regentrification is going on, people are moving back into the big old houses that were around the neighborhood and the community is very well. 
I had a big empty school there, and I didn't know what to do with the school. Um, I uh, also saw the church in terrible repair. The side here is an example of the stained glass that I designed for that church. There's a companion to that that's not in the photograph. This is the, um, this is the evening stars. The other one is the day stars. This is a contemporary window hanging on a wall where there are, there are stained glass that's um, uh, probably dates back uh, to 1880 in the church. This is the interior of the church today. Uh, it's a small little church, close 300 people. But um, it's very, uh, very, uh, very well, I think, designed uh, to the antiquity of the building. And that's something that I think uh, many times we, we, don't over, we, we overlook. Uh, if you're gonna have an ancient, an old building, then you can clean it up but you have to respect where it's been. You just can't come in and throw all this stuff out. Uh, that's what happened to one of the, uh, the priests before me. The, uh, many of you probably know the, the altar and the uh, appointments over there in the guest house, in the chapel there. That came from that church. I gave it to St. Meinrad when we decided to do the interior of this church. We also uh, had a big school, as you can see there. The school had a theater about the size of this, and a big stage like this. It holds 500 people. It had been locked up for years. Fancy plaster on the walls, it was all coming off on one side. So I formed a committee, and we decided to look into what would be the best use of this school that was built in 1932. Rooming house for people, six shut-ins, all kinds of stuff like that came through. But then we looked at the theater, which is right here in this picture. This is the theater right here. This is the theater wing. This is a lobby that's been made into it. This is the church here. That's the rectory there. And this is the Clifton Center, as it's called known now. There are more people using the Clifton Center today than there ever has been in its history. In that particular facility, there are the, there's the theater. Once we restored it, we opened it up with Tony and Tina's Wedding. Do you know that? It, it was a Broadway musical that came from Broadway to the Louisville area, and it ran for seven and a half weeks, Tony and Tina's Wedding. The place was filled every night, and that's how we got the thing into, into uh, the public mind. Outside of that, uh, there's uh, yoga that's taught there, there's a dance school there, there's um, uh, three studios for artists, there are meeting rooms for the parish and meeting rooms for people, there's a young ballet, a young school ballet uh, group there. The whole building now has been totally re restored and renewed, and it belongs to the community. You see, art is something other than just simply painting, pictures, it's everything that you and I do in life. And we need to satisfy that hunger for beauty, for the transcendentals, for that which gives us another insight into God's world. And so that's the function of the, uh, the um, Clifton Center as it's known today. Uh, during this time, too, I uh, have written some books. Uh, they're homilies, they were homily books. The first one was uh, entitled Linger and Be Available, which is sort of something I like to use as a mantra. The second is unpacking for the journey, getting rid of excess stuff we carry around that blocks us from seeing beauty in life, in ourselves, in each other, in nature and God. Embracing the Source is the third book. And then finally, we did a, a, um, a Francis of Rome community book, church community. It's an illustrated coffee table book that uh, people have uh, used and um, collect about the 
whole history of that particular little parish and um, uh, the surrounding area. I um, also had the opportunity of, I didn't, but uh, the previous pastor had the opportunity of, of uh, commissioning this particular art piece of art by Peter Watts, an Englishman. It's called The Seed of Wisdom uh, for the parish. This one right here is the picture, is a statue by a local um, uh, artist. It's bronze, and it is uh, Francis of Rome. Francis, if you don't know, Francis of Rome lived in 1400 during the reconstruction of Rome. She was a very wealthy woman, and she organized all the social services of Rome after the, uh, the uh, Pope returned from Avignon. And then, um, as life goes on. This is, uh, I was over in Egypt and I found some camel bells. So I brought it back and I designed this cross that's used as a processional cross at Advent and at uh, Lent. It's sort of interesting at night, you know, and you come up and they, they just a little hint of a sound that speaks to us of the coming feasts. Um, there I am painting. I like to go out on location and just dabble, you know. It's relaxing, it's fun. There's another part of a show, uh, that's an old show years ago, pen and ink. That painting there was the one I was painting in the first picture, right there. Then, um, there I am doing another painting that they had found some inspiration in a bowler hat. I thought that might work. <laughs> I'll go to any extreme to do what I want to do. <laughs> so we go then to finally where I live now. I'm retired and I like gardening and I like uh, to design things. And so this is a uh, corner of my yard. Uh, the uh, pieces right here, wait a minute. That and this came from Chicago. They were ornamentations of the Scotch scrapers in Chicago built in 1900. When they tore the things down, they were put into a salvage yard and I found them up there. And so I brought those back and set them into my yard as the corner of this particular fountain. This is the other end. This is another fountain. That's my studio. I uh, finally have that place that I don't have to clean up. My mother said, uh, clean up your room, clean up your mess. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's a gazebo and some statues. That brings me to uh, pretty much the end of my presentation. I um, just simply close with one more statement. That's the inside of my studio. I didn't mean to do that, but that's what it looks like. It's a painting that I did in Croatia. Back to that one. If you don't remember anything else about this presentation, you might remember that life is a process and we are all in the process of becoming. And if I have to paint that painting again, I would probably certainly not show the whole face, but I would bring it over just a little bit more to that part because you see there's still more to come. Thank you.